Hi, Clutter Fairy fans. This is the Clutter Fairy Weekly for June 22nd, 2021. I'm your co-host, Ed Gumnick, and I'm speaking with Gail Goddard, certified professional organizer and owner of the Clutter Fairy in Houston, Texas. Hi, everybody. The Clutter Fairy Weekly is a webcast and podcast where we dig deep into the clutter that stands between people and the lives they want to be living. We aim to make sense of where so much stuff comes from in the first place, and we offer strategies to slow down the accumulation, reduce the collection, and comfortably manage the stuff we choose to keep. And we rely heavily on the questions and topic suggestions we get from you, our viewers and listeners. If you're joining us in Zoom for the first time, you can share your comments and questions via the chat, and I'll try to make sure Gail gets to them before we move on to another topic. You can also use the raise hand feature to let me know if you would like to make a comment or ask a question yourself via audio or video. We're also streaming the webcast live on Facebook, and I'll be keeping an eye on that so you can share questions and comments there, and I'll relay them to Gail. And during the live webcast every Tuesday, you can call us at 669-900-6833. Use meeting ID 993-419-863 and password clutter to join the meeting. We're going to start as we usually do by following up on last week's tittle, which was called Glitter and Glue and Buttons and Beads. The assignment was to examine and evaluate a subset of your creative stash to revisit your craft space, equipment, or supplies, then apply various filters to reduce the volume. We want to hear from our participants in Zoom and Facebook who made progress this week on an art room or craft space. Please let us know in response to last week's episode, YouTube viewer Ruth wrote, my main crafting and storage room is upstairs, but lately I've had trouble going up and downstairs. Therefore, I have several little three-tiered carts downstairs that I keep a few of my card making supplies on that can be wheeled to the dining room table for crafting and then wheeled back into my little corner in my spare bedroom. It works for me. Like many of us, Ruth is having to make adjustments to changes in her mobility, uh, but that doesn't mean she has to give up the crafts that she loves, and she's found a flexible workaround to continue crafting. So well done, Ruth. And those carts that roll, that have several drawers and they're on wheels, they're a really good adaptation for uh, flexibility and mobility and you can move it in and out and it's not about lifting it's just about pushing something around and so um, those carts are really really helpful for that process okay well let's get to our main topic because we have a lot to talk about we constantly make judgments about worth assessing and assigning value to our lives and our stuff but our notions of perceived value can clash with the reality of our physical surroundings so today we're going to examine value-based emotional responses and habits of thought that sabotage our ability to get or stay organized. We're calling today's show, For What It's Worth, Assessing Value in the Struggle Against Clutter. When you get to a certain age, the Antiques Roadshow becomes a very entertaining show to watch. All of those experts with decades of knowledge in their various fields telling you that your great-grandmother's antique tea table is worth $40,000. The shock and awe on their faces when they hear what the experts say something is worth. It's fun, so fun to watch. We all want to be them in that moment, and such is the allure of television. The show's appeal is built on the 10 pieces that people brought to an event that are really worth something out of the hundreds of people that come with stuff that are worth somewhere between nothing and a few hundred dollars. The show records interviews about the 1% of items that are a success story. And we watch that show expecting everyone goes home that happy. But in the back of our minds, we know that's not real. Just watch the feedback booth at the end where each person says, I thought grandma's thing was worth a lot of money, but it's actually worth $5. That is by far the more typical experience for the people that come to the show. In our own homes, we see our items through that antique roadshow colored glasses. When we consider our own special things, our biggest value-based judgment about them is always monetary. And it's always fueled by our parents' belief that something inherited is valuable. They told you some object or piece of furniture is worth so much because it's many generations old or they spent a fortune on it. And it drives our belief in how precious it is. We treat something like it's a gold nugget we're holding. 
The truth is that the market and pricing for those beautiful bone china sets and the silver flatware and the tea services and the hand blown crystal glassware and antique furniture from some past period have drastically fallen. And they've fallen under two pressures. One pressure is that the interest in such pieces has drastically disappeared. Young people don't want to keep a 12 piece place setting of china with matching silver and crystal stemware. Our culture is shifting away from that level of formal dining and formal entertaining. So the interest in, in acquiring these objects has faded. Demand has fallen off, reflecting a cultural shift that likely will not rebound. Second, the prices have fallen because of a glut of product on the market. There are so many people trying to get rid of four sets of inherited china and hardly anyone trying to buy them. The supply greatly outstretches the demand and that drops the value also. So between a vast supply and very low interest, the price value that your parents and your grandparents and your great grandparents paid for their place settings and then counted on the stuff to hold has collapsed. The pieces just don't hold that value anymore. The same is true of the furniture. Antique furniture may be beautifully made and solid wood and a brilliant example of craftsmanship, but old dark wood furniture just isn't popular right now. Again, a glut of product on the market makes the resale prices very low compared to the original price. And this is a turnaround from how it's been for decades, but the bottom has, been, has dropped out. There are some exceptions, of course, for extreme rarity and good condition, but only if you have a buyer willing to collect that rarity. Otherwise, it may be rare and still no one wants to pay for it. It's hard to face the change from your parents' belief in the value of something to the reality of the value today. Additionally, the internet creates the illusion that it'll be easy to find a buyer for everything, but you're still looking for a needle in a haystack. It's still going to take time and work and patience to find a buyer that sees and is willing to pay what you see as the value of the object. This may turn around someday in the future. All things old become new again eventually. But when might that happen? 20 years from now? 50 years? If you're looking to sell now, that won't help you get a great price today or help you find a buyer. Now that I've laid it out, I think it creates an emotional burden to be trying to sell or pass on these objects that have lost their value on our watch, so to speak. It feels like betraying your family ancestry to be giving it away when your ancestors valued these objects so much and put so much store in their retaining their value. That guilt keeps us from seeing things in a realistic way and it encourages us to keep things because we can't find the right person to take it or we can't get the right price for it. A client I worked with this week had a large bedroom dresser in her mother's house that we were moving to my client's new home. She kept telling me it was a Pennsylvania house dresser and that made it very important to her. She had used it as a teenager and she's currently in her forties. So the dresser is over 25 years old. It was absolutely well made and solid wood, etc. but it was an old style of furniture in a brown stain with scalloped edges and old style metal drawer pulls. It was very dated looking and her husband hated it, not having grown up with it, but looking at it with an unattached adult's point of view. She insisted it go to the new house because she could still see it through her mother's eyes. I suspect it won't last long there because it doesn't match the new home's modern style at all. And when she sells it at the estate sale, it'll fetch a few hundred dollars, despite her belief in how prestigious and well-made it is. Think about the market for collectibles for a minute. The value of collectibles is also a distorted perception. The item will not always be as collectible as it is in the moment when you're keen on something. When you're jumping into it, it's almost always at the high point of the market. The buzz starts, you notice the interest, and you jump on, along with everyone else driving the pricing up in that moment. Then the fad is over and the prices plummet, leaving everyone with their flavor of the moment collectible that now no one wants to collect. The Beanie Baby craze is a perfect example of that experience. People made money while the fads swept the nation. 
Those with lots of inventory when the fad was over lost all of all, almost all of their investment and hardly anything comes back around at that fever pitch. There are still people with Beanie Baby collections and there are some still being made, but it's not the market on fire that it was in that moment of time and will likely never return to that fevered level. You end up with a collection at some point that you have invested a bunch of time and energy and money in and that you have great focus and interest and knowledge about and so it's really super valuable to you, but there may not be equivalent people out there calling, <laughs> calling it the next best thing and wanting to take it away from you for money later. So we get sort of upside down in our collections as well. Naomi, yeah. Naomi mentions, you know, that that's called a bubble when the price gets driven way up above anything rational and it's reasonable right? con connected connected to the reality of of you know what things what things are will ultimately be worth exactly and i think um the market for those home goods the china the crystal the antique furniture while that kind of dining and entertaining was the cultural norm those values held but now that there's been a cultural shift in how we do it, there are still people buying and selling that kind of stuff, but there's not very many people doing it. It's a much more narrow market for it. And it, and it doesn't have the same, even so it doesn't have the same value as it would have had in its heyday. And I think we have just arrived at, we're the generation where the heyday has now collapsed and we're the ones left holding generations worth of household goods that were deemed valuable in the moment. And that moment has now passed and we're all trying to dispose of them and supposedly get money out of them. And, and there is still the risk that we have one or two items that are still have some value in the current collectible market that there's some reason why this version or this paint color or this thing with an error in it, you know, when the, the money that gets collected where they stamped and had an error in it, and then all those errored coins are way more valuable than the ones that are normal. And so there's, there's always some little uh, paths of collectible richness and huge value. But the problem is that none of us are the experts to know the answer. We can't look at all of our parents stuff and go the one percent of this stuff that's really valuable is that one and that one and that one and all the rest of this stuff really isn't and so without paying for an expert to come and look and without trusting that expert how many times have we seen on the road show that oh this person valued they had it valued at one point and it was valued at five thousand dollars and the road show said yeah the current mark for that is sixty thousand dollars like you have to trust some expert in the moment who gives a valuation in the moment. And that moment may be changing all the time. The value is changing all the time. And it's really hard to know. Yes, it's worth something and it's going to stay being worth something because that those prices are constantly in flux. And so trying to figure out, trying to acquire the expertise to value your own collection is way too big of a task for the average person trying to find an expert that you can trust to give you a good valuation for what it's worth in the moment is also difficult. And then once they give you a valuation, it's only good for today or this week or this month, you have to be then immediately turn it around to get the valuation they give you. If you get a valuation this year and then you don't go to try to sell it five years from now, that valuation is now useless. It doesn't mean anything. So, it makes our management of those objects and getting whatever perceived value out of them really difficult. April said recently I saw that Yu-Gi-Oh, I guess that's how that's pronounced, or mm -hmm. Yu-Gi-Oh, mm -hmm. and Pokemon first edition cards could be worth a lot of money, but to authenticate them, you need to pay about $300 for each card. I'd rather just assume they are not first edition. And right. the there's a larger point there, which is that the people who position themselves professionally with the expertise and the 
the specific knowledge that are, are spending all day long in the market watching and paying attention they're the ones who make some money and and the <laughs> and the well in the secondary mar market of authenticators and traders and so the odds unless you want to acquire that that expertise yourself and do that as a job mm -hmm. you are not going to you're not going to be making a whole lot of money off of your collectibles it should be about other value the other kinds of value the other meanings of value do you love it <laughs> right do you love it enough to use it and is yeah. it important to you for some other reason does is it, spark it useful joy, right yeah is it useful does it spark joy does it look good in your home does it mm -hmm. make you f feel warm and fuzzy or do you enjoy showing it off to your friends you love the colors whatever I guess the idea is of uh, collectibles is it needs to shift from I know this is I'm collecting this because it's worth a whole lot of money to I'm collecting this because this makes me happy I find this interesting I find this valuable I I have a collection of beads and I have thousands of dollars invested in those beads let me tell you and if somebody had to fire sale out my collection there's some pieces in there that are no longer made they're from artists that no longer do the work there's you know there's i have french beads from the 20s that i have you know run across over my lifetime i mean there's things in there that would mean something to somebody that knew a lot about beads but if somebody was trying to get rid of my whole collection it would be way too much work for them to go through and figure out what I know about the pieces and what is valuable and what isn't, and then try to find a, a bead person that wants to collect them now when I bought it, you know, 20 years ago. And I buy the beads because I think that they're pretty and I think they're fun to work with. And whatever monetary value I sunk into them in the moment is unlikely to be recouped on the back end, right? It is 100% sunk cost for me. And so in the future, will there be people looking at my stuff and going, oh, that's super cool. But it won't be something that happens for the entire collection or all at once. And so I say all this and we, we broach this topic because I know that everyone struggles with you know, I inherited this China from my mother and I know it's valuable, but I don't want to use it, but I don't want to, nobody in my family wants it, but, but, but. Or I spent a whole bunch of money on it 10 years ago, five years ago, yesterday. <laughs> so right. even now, even though it's not what I need, in large part, value is just an assignment we we make it's an assessment we make and About assign to something yeah. it's not a durable and transcendent quality of an any object yeah yeah naomi said mm -hmm. inherited two 19th century french paintings from my parents insurance mm -hmm. valuations four thousand <laughs> and six thousand valuation by art dealer when handling their escape estate uh, 3,000 and 2,000, so about, ha you know, half. Valuation when offering one for actual auction, found a tear, might be worth a few hundred, but probably wouldn't sell. And I would be out the $150 fee I would have to pay the dealer to handle it. Even on the Antiques Roadshow, they say, I think on in an auction, it would be worth this. I think for insurance purposes, you should insure it for that. And the value that they give for insurance purposes is always much higher inflated mm -hmm. yeah and i think that that's typical for you know if it goes up in flames in a house fire or if somebody steals it the replace the ability to replace it is almost impossible and that makes the value of the object higher if you were just going to go put it in an auction and hope that enough people showed up to fight over it <laughs> you're probably going to get this level instead of this level and i wanted to address this because we all are inheriting the furniture, the accumulated stream of furniture from our antecedents. And we're all of the China and the crystal and the flatware and everybody's worrying about what to do with it. 
and they're quite shocked when they realize that they're trying to get rid of it and so is the rest of the baby boomer generation and the generations that come behind us could not give a flip about this stuff and so whatever value we thought we inherited isn't there and I have this conversation with clients every day just like I did about the Pennsylvania house dresser this is, this was my grandmother's and, and it's China and it, it, yeah. And you know what they're doing with those China sets now? The mosaic artists are breaking them into pieces and putting them into artwork. So it's not even being used as China. It's being bought for the decorative pattern and broken into pieces and made into art. So it's purpose as this beautiful piece of China has passed mostly, and it's going to become some kind of scrap material for another use. It's being repurposed, which is awesome, <laughs> but it's not going to be, there's not going to be a bunch of people sitting around going, oh, look at this China I got at the thrift shop today. I got such a deal. And now I'm going to serve, you know, I'm going to have a dinner party for 12 people and I'm going to serve them on this China. That's not how they're doing business these days. That's not how they're entertaining their friends. And so it's going to be something that we're going to have to adjust our thinking and get okay with it so that a we don't feel guilty about not making money off mom and dad and grandma stuff and b we feel okay with deciding that we also don't want to use these objects and we can set them free for whatever next purpose they're going to have because keeping them in the house is just going to be passing that burden on to the next round of people behind you who are going to have to do the same thing I inherited it from mother. She thought it was worth something. And now what do I do with it? And so shoving it in the closet, uh, hiding it in a cabinet, taking up good storage space, <laughs> packing it to move it. Um, the same woman that had the Pennsylvania house thing also had a bunch of bone china. And it was something that she and her mother shared in collecting. They both liked to collect them. And like they liked the process of going to look for them and find them. And so... I wrapped up several sets of bone china that she's just keeping as memories for the fun that she and her mother had. But two working adults in the house, nobody is having lavish dinner parties with all this china that she and her mother bought. So she's just keeping it for her own sentimental value and how she remembers having fun with her mom, which is great, but we got a store you know, four 12 piece settings, of four different pieces of China in somewhere in this house. And I'm going to be climbing up on ladders and putting them up on shelves way up at the top over my head because that's, they just have to be out of the way. They're not going to get used and they're going to be a problem. And there's a kid in the house. And so we can't have access. The kid can't have access to them or not break them. And so it's a whole storage issue that is born on the fact that we received, we didn't buy most of this stuff. We just received it all. And now we're the last one standing, holding a bunch of China in our hands going, oh God, what do we do now? <laughs> and I don't want you to feel bad about it. I don't want you to feel the, so many people are like, I feel so guilty or they're mad or they feel like the people at the antique store or at the resale store are not being truthful with them or ripping them off and all of these negative feelings that come because I'm not able to ascribe the value that I think my parents told me it was worth and I can't get that kind of money out of it and therefore either A, I'm angry at somebody else who I think is lying to me or B, I feel guilty and so... <clears throat> Then you walk away with a bunch of bad feelings about it and, a pro and still haven't solved the problem. So I'm just trying to reflect back to you that this is really a cultural shift. It's not because you've fallen down on the job and you're not doing what you need to do to get the right value out of it. It's that they're, the real market for this stuff has changed and you're not going to be able to get the value out of it most of the time. And I will say, because I know there's somebody out there that's going to hear this and they're going to be like, but, 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 but I know this is worth blah, yada, 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 yada. And yes, there are things out there. There are still people collecting antiques. There's still people buying China. It's just the slimmest market. That's all. It's just a very small market. And there are 
rare things and uh, special items and special makers that there's going to be the rare piece that does have some value and has some crazy collectible worth. And how are you going to figure that out without a bunch of work? And how are you, do you think that your kids are going to figure it out? If you keep it for them and you don't figure it out and leave it for them to figure out, like which one of you is going to become the antique expert and figure out that of all these things, those two pieces are worth it. And so. And what is your time worth? Do you have the time to spare to do that research? And do you have the interest to do that research? Because unless you're really into that thing, that's, it's just going to be hard, tedious work to try and track it down. When you take that stuff to a charity resale shop, they have the shelf space and the patience to put it out there where it can sit for a few days, weeks, months, years, yes. till someone with a great interest in it comes along and then they get then they get some benefit from it, but you don't have to sit on it for all that time. Yeah, you, Naomi, to, you find the space for it. Naomi with the painting said, my sister wanted them and they're hanging in her living room now. So it, if they mean something to your sister, she likes them. She associates with them with your parents. She thinks they're beautiful. There's the real value of them. Right. And Lise said, collect something you love, not what you can sell it for down the road. Yes. Yes. So that your entertainment factor is because you think it's cool. Like, like I said, I love those beads and only another crazy bead addict like me would be finding that collection super cool. I don't collect them because I think I'm going to make money on them later. I collect them because it makes me um, excited to see the glass and the colors and what I'm going to do with it. And, it, and that's where I get the joy out of it. Um, I think that we have to shift the perception of the best thing I can do for my parents is get money out of this object to won't it be wonderful if I release this into the wild, if I give this object to a resale store and um, put it out there for a little bit of money and let somebody who is madly collecting China to come on their weekly pass through the resale store looking to see what's shown up and for them to find the gem, for them to find the thing that is, oh my gosh, I got it for $5 and it's really worth a lot of money. This is a special, like, think of oh. how you can send the thrill of the hunt out into the world so that the person that is that expert and is looking for it can have the thrill and live the thrill of finding it. I found the comment in question uh, that, okay. that, I, that I had couldn't lay my it's hands lost. on it. And yeah. I want to read it because it, it um, I didn't really do it justice. This is from Kathy on Facebook. And she said, when I donated nicer things, either my mom's or my own to a charity thrift shop, the workers told me that the nice stuff generated extra interest in their entire store. Word of mouth, cell phones, et cetera, alerted shoppers and the foot traffic was up for days after the nicer items hit the shelves. Therefore, more actual value came from the donations. You're sort of pooling the value that you can't monetize with some other with other people's donations to create yeah. more value for, you know, to create a, a marketable value for the thrift shop. Which is awesome. And Judy Judith says. After my mother-in-law's death, my husband and his sister have been methodically going through every single rare collectible, she put it in quotation marks, in her house. It's been over nine months. They will pretty much be selling Hummels and other items for a fraction of what was originally paid. Their deceased father was not a collector, but bowing to family <laughs> pressure to collect something, he reluctantly bought Hot Wheels model cars. He left a shoebox full of them all in original packaging. Out of an entire house full of collectibles, his small collection is truly the only thing that will realize a substantial profit. <laughs> I'm sure Charlie is laughing up in heaven. He made, <laughs> right? he made the smartest going. decision out of everyone. <laughs> so tall. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it sounds like because he wasn't super interested in it anyway, he didn't madly collect it. He had a shoebox full. So he didn't have 500 pieces. He had 20 pieces. And, and it's much more manageable that way. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. 
Yeah. I mean, the, the issue that I have with clients mostly is they're feeling guilty or bad or ripped off or, um, you know, they had been banking on it being worth a lot of money and then they find out that it's not and they're sad or angry. And so I'm just saying, be prepared that, that you don't probably have a, um, you know, a college education tuitions worth of money sitting around in the house. You're not going to be able to go to Hawaii on the proceeds. And um, yes, you could make a little bit of money, but you're going to have to do a lot of work and you can really just see it as I can release this object. I can make this thing uh, go uh, not be my problem to manage. And I can put it out in front of other people who really are, interested in collecting and let them have it and have the thrill of finding something new and special let go of the emotional weight of the burden and you know the hummels are a perfect example of it was a craze it was an expensive craze that everybody got into and there are so much so many hummels coming back on to the you know secondary market as people Re, all the baby boomers release the Hummel collection they made their whole lifetime. As, as the Hummel generation goes into assisted living. <laughs> yes, yes, 100%. And now there's a million of them out there and no one is collecting them. And so, yeah, you spent the money on it and you were able to show your friends that you had 25 Hummels and they knew that you spent good money on them and wasn't that impressive. And now, too bad the ship has sailed and no one's doing that anymore. So, that was the more expensive version of the Beanie Babies, right? Like you could buy Beanie Babies for five or 10 or 20 bucks, but the Hummels were hundreds, hundreds. of dollars a piece. Yeah. And so it was a different level of investing in a craze. And, um, and that craze will never come back at that level. There will probably be very unique Hummels that they didn't make very many of, that had errors in them, that whatever, there'll be some very slim little portion of those Hummels that stay on the collectible market with value. And the rest will just slowly become decorative objects that aren't worth, you know, 10 bucks a piece. And, and yeah, nobody wants to realize that they spent $200 and now it's going to be worth 10, but welcome to the nature of collectibles. Um, <laughs> this is how the market ebbs and flows. Anya has a great comment. She says, I've learned to ask myself what impacts the new thingy will have on different parts of my life, cost, space, time, et cetera. That's a very interesting. It's a good point. It is a good point because, you know, value, we decide what, what the standard is according to which we assign things value mm -hmm. and something that's worth a lot of money, but it's taking up a lot of room in your home. You don't like it. It's not useful to you. It doesn't have it. It it, it doesn't have a real value that goes with that that number that was the mm -hmm. price. Mm -hmm. It's true. Um, Samudra says, "Mama kept Daddy in check by making him store his junk under our three bedroom bungalow." Something made by Tesla probably lurked there, but after Daddy died, we had no way to contact anyone who'd know how, how to value what he had, and we had it hauled for $1,000. I mean, we paid the $1,000. Oh, right? Isn't that hard? And that's what happens. You end up, it becomes a collection that you have to dispose of somehow, and you end up spending money or not getting anything any interest about making it turn into cash for you. And that's always a hard shocker. There's a few things that save their value, you know, diamonds, gold, silver, uh, the metals are still collectible. And even that, the gold, the, the metals market goes up and down all the time, right? It changes. And so if you have jewelry, maybe it's not worth anything as the piece of jewelry that it is. Maybe it's only worth what the gold weight is if they melt it down and you get value for the gold and yeah, and truthfully d diamonds only maintain their value because there is a an effective monopoly that keeps keeps their prices high right 
And, and if, that's a cultural norm that hasn't shifted yet. Yeah. Like people are still buying diamond engagement rings and they're still buying diamond earrings as, as an expression of love and attention and they keep the market high. And someday diamond engagement rings may stop being a cultural norm. And when it does, there'll be a lot of diamond rings out there that won't have any value anymore. Yeah. But we're not there yet. It hasn't yeah. shifted here yet. Um, people are still, you know, wanting to walk around with their two carat ring on to show that it's, you know, really worth a lot of money. But it, um, Joyce has a comment that I, that is funny in light of the conversation you and I had as we we're preparing. Joyce said, I had planned on keeping mugs that have been gifts from friends and students over the past 30 plus years, hoping I could learn to make a mosaic using them. What a relief when I let go of that aspiration and donated the mugs to Goodwill. I, I'm go. laughing because I was <laughs> I was holding up a mug that I was using it as an example for Gail and saying, the reality is, no matter how much I like this one particular mug, I could go out to any yard sale any day <laughs> and, and buy 300 of them 300 for $5. Of them. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> it's uh, so true. <laughs> um, let, let's pause for a moment for a, an, an, an announcement or two, and then we'll okay. come back to this. I want to remind those who are watching or listening um, live that our YouTube channel has more than 150 videos on a wide variety of organizing topics. I may have to update that number again because we're cranking out one a week. So um, visit cfhou.com slash YouTube. While you're there, subscribe to our channel and click the bell icon next to the subscribe button if you'd like to get notified by YouTube when we post something new. We also wanna say a thank you to Liz and Sarah for becoming our newest Patreon supporters this week. If you'd like to help support our efforts with a recurring monthly donation of any size, please visit cfhou.com slash Patreon. Your contribution, contributions help us offset the costs of producing the weekly webcast and will help us fund new projects that we have in the works. Thank you for your generosity, Liz, Sarah, and all of our patrons. Marcy said, unfortunately, my husband wants to keep a lot of his mom's stuff, but did get rid of quite a bit. We will be opening a soup kitchen soon because we certainly have enough pots to cook it in. Big <laughs> pots. You got your mother's big pot collection, huh? The mother-in-law's big pot collection. And you have to know that this is round one for him. Yeah. Trying to make good value decisions about what to keep and what not to keep is very hard in that moment of grief. And we always either in our stress, keep too much or throw away stuff that we regret later. And so it's a very difficult time to be making those decisions. And if he errs on the side of caution and he keeps too much, just know that, you know, a little ways down the road, a couple of years down the road, he may be able to, he'll be a little bit more emotionally sound about it and he'll be able to see that a little clearer and he will probably be able to let go of another round of stuff. Um, sometimes it just takes some peeling of the onion because it's, it's so hard in the moment when you're trying to deal with somebody's stuff. Here's a fantastic <clears throat> comment I want to share from Naomi. Okay. First, first world problem. We are the inheritors, inheritors of generations of peace and prosperity. Make a donation of it as an expression of gratitude that it hasn't been swept away by floods, fires, or bombs. It's a very good point. That's brilliant. Man, that's that terrific. is absolutely brilliant and yeah. 100% true. With the decades of peace and prosperity, right? That is really amazing. Thank you for making that point. And it's a perfect place to pivot your point of view and think of it from that direction. Like I can give it away in, in gratitude for the fact that my life is peaceful and um, my family's objects and inheritance and land and has all been, has all survived because of the peace and prosperity that we've lived in for the last several decades. It's 100% true. Um, Anya has another, another good point. Anya says, market change is what I've experienced with my very high quality filing cabinet. Rarely anybody wants one while almost everybody is going digital. Right. And that's a good point. You know, I mean, 20 years ago, I amassed 
the world's largest privately held collection of office supplies in a fabulous cabinet. And, you know, then within, within less than five years, so much of my work went from paper to not print. paper. Yeah, from yeah, print from, to digital. From print to, you know, nowadays I refer to something, if I design something for which the final product is a PDF, I call that print because it's closer to print than the, the stuff that's purely, ele- you know, purely digital, purely mm-hmm. online. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, the market has dropped, the bottom has dropped out of the market for filing cabinets. The mar- bottom has dropped out of the market for reams and reams of paper. We don't even keep a printer in the house anymore because we need to print so rarely. It's just mm-hmm. not worth taking up that space. And that's been a, that's a perfect example of the cultural change that we're talking about. The, the supplies and the objects that supported the way that we did business when you and I came out of school is 100% different now. And the idea of having an entire row of file cabinets in your home office is just not normal anymore. It's not necessary and it's not normal. And so there are a lot of, uh, you know, fancy file cabinets out there that nobody really needs anymore and so when somebody says to me now it used to be a joke earlier in my business do you think i need to buy another file cabinet and i would always say god no because i (laughs) under no circumstances right because i knew that there was reams of paper that just hadn't been gone through and and thinned out and that they had plenty in the file cabinets they had but now the answer would be absolutely not you're not storing that level of paper ever uh, most people in the house can get away with a portable file box if they want. And so it's really just our cultural experience has been completely changed by the digital, digital revolution. And you don't need those supplies. You don't need the storage for those supplies anymore. There you go. JC shared, when my in-law's home was sold, each child inherited one of the China sets. We got the one we liked was wonderful with some wonderful serving plates and bowls. We purchased the cabinet to store them, had planned to use them for daily use. When we unpacked the boxes six months later, two boxes were missing. We ended up with the boxes of the ones that were chipped and broken. We were planning to throw them if we didn't have the space to keep them with the ones in, with the ones in good condition. It's a mystery what happened to the good dishes. Ha ha, all that for nothing. Oh God, that must have been so frustrating when you open those up. Yeah. But I guess, you know, on, you can also look at it that the universe took care of you. <laughs> right. And it rerouted the burden somewhere else. It simplified your choices. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. I'm sure that was disappointing. But there you go. Man, yeah. so many good comments today. <laughs> Catherine said, in the mid 80s, my mom's family moved to Turkey. She asked me to keep rooms full of furniture for her because it was too expensive to move. Right. Always yeah. wanting to stay, stay on her good side. I agreed. My house was stuffed, overstuffed. Seven years later, she returned and wouldn't take her stuff back. Uh, Seriously? Mom, come (laughs) on, man. Let's get real. And, you know, truthfully, there is so much to be had out there. The idea of packing up, you know, I'm going to move to Australia. I'm going to pack up all of my objects. I'm going to put it on a boat. It's in a container. It's going to be shipped across the world. And then I'm going to have to pay somebody to unpack it and haul it. No, it's sell what you got here and buy there and cut out the whole travel thing. Like it's just not worth it. And it's way too expensive to transport stuff over long distances. And so, oh my God, no, (laughs) that's just insane. And we've been doing it for a long time because of the scarcity but our culture has evolved and like she said we're much more prosperous now and you can buy stuff in the location where you are that's just as good as the stuff that you have where you're coming from and so the whole idea of moving it all across country is not that's in the middle of shifting people still do it people still wrap up and drive from texas to california with their stuff or vice versa and you pay, you know, $3,000 or $4,000 to get it all wrapped and put across the country. And then you open it up and two years later, you're putting it out in the thrift sale. Like 
it's just a, it's a it's a shift in mentality that's starting to take place that I've seen, and um, it'll be interesting to see when that becomes the norm that you take personal items and you basically leave all the furniture behind where you are and start over at the other end. Take your favorites and leave the rest, and we'll see when that becomes the norm instead. Maybe before Rowan, I retire or not. <laughs> Rowan has a comment that's short and to the point. She says, Hummel is hideous. <laughs> and Anya chimed in on that one too. And I have to say, I'm going to, I'm going to come out now as a Hummel hater. My grandmother, <laughs> my grandmother had several pieces and they're creepy. Well, and I, and I realize that's just a, a reflection style. of, it's a reflection of changing tastes, but right. I found them super duper creepy. Right. Isn't that funny? And the people that are still very invested in the fact that Hummel is collectible are horrified to hear that somebody was like, ooh, I don't like how that looks. But the idea, the whole idea, the premise of here is a collectible piece of cast china, you know, porcelain that is sitting there and it's hand painted and it's a little decorative object is seen for people to look at. It's like, we just aren't doing that in the same way anymore. And the idea of having a whole bunch of things sitting around, our version of the Victorian age has passed and we're moving away from having a lot of stuff out sitting around to look at. And so, yeah, Hummels, the whole purpose for Hummels is fading in the culture at the moment. And so uh, it, therefore its value is fading as well much shock to the people that collected them so fervently over their lifetime to find out that and yeah it's not going to really be the whole um, retirement nesting that they thought it would be okay just a, a bummer just way way too many comments to even get to we have to we have to move on okay i want to remind everyone that we'll be back next week tuesday june 29th at noon u.s central time live in zoom and streaming on facebook we have set ourselves a challenge for next week. Gail and I think we can identify an organizing concept, challenge, or tip for every letter of the alphabet. And so next week's show <laughs> is going to be the ABCs of clutter, an alphabet of organizing ideas. Wish so us luck. <laughs> tune, in, tune in to see if we really came up with something for- if we pulled it off or not. <laughs> Q and X and Z, which are going to be a little challenging, but I have a few thoughts on the matter. Oh, that's I funny. always have something to say. Yeah, right. right? <laughs> okay. Um, why don't you give us the weekly tittle? Okay. The weekly tittle is called The Unexpected Guest. With apologies to Agatha Christie, who apparently wrote a book of the same name. A play. A play. Of, of the there same we go. name. Okay. So we want you to take a look at your space from a fresh perspective. Wander through your home and try to see it from the viewpoint of a sudden and unexpected visitor. For example, a casual acquaintance, your boss, a new neighbor, your pastor, or a judgmental in-law. Identify an item or a room that you would be embarrassed for that outsider to see. There's no limit to where this exercise might take you. Is there a horizontal surface to which the clutter just naturally gravitates? Are there groceries or shopping bags that have never been unpacked and put away? Has the laundry, dirty or clean, escaped the bounds of the hamper or even spilled beyond the laundry room? If you had five minutes to get ready for the unexpected visitor in question, What's the single item you'd most like for them not to see? See if you can identify those things and move some of them around. Go put them up, clean it up, make it not look like you would be embarrassed if the person walked in the house. And then give us a report about what that object was that you're like, oh my God, if my boss came over, I would die of embarrassment if they saw fill in the blank. We can't wait to hear what it is. And that is what we want you to work on this week. Let me tell you, uh, the, 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 one of my inspirations for this one was my dad was here on the weekend while my yeah. sister was visiting, yeah. and he sat down in the chair where I am sitting because he gravitates to the comfy chair, Right. and he started poking around in the papers on the little table next to my desk. <laughs> like, okay, 
Dad, need to, stop I need to, touching. <laughs> need to get a little more diligent about putting things away the minute I'm finished with them. So, yeah. And you know, that's such a dad, it's such a parent thing to do, to sit down and just and to find the thing that makes you feel the most cringy while they look at it, right? Right. Do the words, <laughs> none of your beeswax mean nothing to you, old man. Okay. <laughs> if you're watching this on YouTube, we'd love for you to join us live to get notifications about upcoming events. We invite you to join the meetup group by visiting cfhou.com slash meetup. You can also follow us on Facebook by going to cfhou.com slash Facebook or subscribe to our mailing list by visiting cfhou.com slash subscribe. We love to hear from our viewers and listeners, so please send us your questions, comments, and topic suggestions in the YouTube comments, on Facebook, or through the contact form on our website, which you can find at clutterfairyhouston.com. There you go. We are so happy that you came to join us today. We're thrilled that you come and visit and talk with us every week, and it just makes us so happy that you guys have so much to say to each other as well to us. We really appreciate that you've created such a wonderful community of support for each other, and we love to come and add to it and add to the collection of uh, information that you need to get organized. We'll be here next week doing the same thing. Um, I do want to ask Ed, we are going to take a vacation week, but when is that? Do we know when that's coming? Um well, we were definitely talking about taking off the first week in August when I will be burning myself to a crisp at the beach. <laughs> With your family, okay. That's the week of, uh, of the, we, that's the week of August 3rd. Okay. And we were talking about taking off for your travel if you have travel coming, but we didn't nail that down yet. So oh, okay. we'll make announcements well, so we about just that wanna, next week. Yeah, we just want to say there may be a couple of weeks over the summer where we are down and we will... Um, We'll try to keep you updated and give you some warning that that's coming. So otherwise, we'll be back next week for sure yes. for the ABCs. And, you know, think of us over the week as we suffer to generate that material for you. <laughs> All right. We'll see right. you next week. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.